so it's 10 o'clock. Um, I just want to uh, welcome you all and thank you very much for all of you being here with us today. My name is Laura Brenner and I'm the coordinator of Lethbridge Local Immigration Partnership. I am one of a dozen co-hosts of the 2021 National Workplace Inclusion Forum and I'm happy to be here today. And I'm also happy to introduce you to the moderator of today's panel discussion, Mr. Brady Schnell. Brady is the Economic Development Officer for the Town of Clairsome, Alberta. I've had the pleasure of working with Brady for the past couple of years. Brady is the Chair of the Lethbridge Lips Community Partnership Council, and he is also an active member of our employment working group. He hosts our Bridging Immigration and Employment Project. Uh, an eight part learning series that we designed to bring local uh, employers and uh, newcomers together. Brady leads the Rural and Northern Immigration Pilot Project, one of Claire's Homes approaches to solving its own attraction and retention uh, challenges. Our hope for today's panel discussion is to bring some clarity to the role that inclusion practices can play in meeting the unique recruitment and retention challenges many Canadian employers are currently facing. Our planning committee recognizes that resolving these challenges is important for and the job of not only employers and individuals, but also whole, uh, whole communities and regions. Welcome, Brady. Thank you, Laura, for the lovely introduction and hello, everyone. I'm so pleased to be moderating today's panel discussion for our first ever National Workplace Inclusion Forum. My name is Brady Schnell and my pronouns are he, him. And as Laura said, I'm the Economic Development Officer for the Town of Clare's Home in Southern Alberta. I wanna start by allowing the star lineup of panelists to briefly introduce themselves for this discussion on recruitment and retention in a post COVID era. I'm gonna ask that they let you know their name, their position and the organization that they're representing today. We're gonna go alphabetically by last name. So let's start with Erin. Thanks, Brady. Hi, everyone. My name is Erin Ball. My pronouns are she and her. I'm an inclusion coach with Keys Job Center. Thank you, Erin. And Julia. Thanks, Brady. Uh, my name is Julia Higginson and my pronouns are she, her. Uh, and sorry, they're not below my name. I couldn't uh, edit that this morning, but I'm a recruitment and selection advisor with the city of Kingston. Uh, and if anyone's not familiar, Kingston is a mid-sized municipality in Ontario. So we're located between basically right in the middle of Toronto and Ottawa. Excellent, and Jeremy. Thanks, Brady. Hi everyone, my name is Jeremy jones Julia. My pronouns are he and him, and I am the National Talent Acquisition Manager for Starbucks Coffee Canada. Thank you, Jeremy. And Philip. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with everyone. My name is Philip Mondor. I'm president and CEO of Tourism HR Canada, which is a pan Canadian organization whose work is all to help the industry um, improve on its labor market conditions. Nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And finally, Maha. Hi everyone, my name is Maha. My pronouns are she and her. I am the National Recruiting and Sourcing uh, Leader for IKEA Canada. Great, and that's your star lineup of panelists today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we just have a couple of housekeeping items before we jump right in. French language interpretation and live captioning are available for this meeting. Please use the controls at the bottom of your screen to activate those options. Natasha is writing more detailed instructions in the chat now on how you can participate in French language and live captioning. Please use the Q&A feature to ask any questions at any time. Uh, we'll do our best to get to as many audience questions as possible. Uh, if you prefer to speak your question, you can use the raised hand and we might find time to do that. Uh, it will be a tight hour as we have five panelists and, and a great topic of discussion. So I encourage you guys to consider using the Q&A function. We'll do our best uh, to answer the questions that come forward. Uh, please note that this session is being recorded uh, and it will be shared on the Workplace Inclusion Charter website. 
So with that, we are going to jump right in. And uh, my first question, I'm gonna go direct to Philip. Philip, the unmet labor demand the country was experienced pre-pandemic has been heightened and the problem is more complex. Despite the high levels of unemployment, why are businesses in many industries struggling to find and keep staff? Well, Brady, thank you for that question. It's one that I get asked frequently. As an organization, we've been tracking all of the impacts of COVID in the last 19 months. What we know are workers are not returning to work or they're unable to return to work for a number of reasons. According to the data, there's really some clear trends and I'll quickly run through those, but there's two sort of major categories. One we call COVID-induced reasons or there are the reasons why um, we're facing challenges that are unique because of COVID. And those include things like instability or instable employment because businesses are not yet back up to uh, the, at the mode of operating that they normally would. Or risk group and can't take the risk of working in a COVID environment. One who's in that situation or often their family caring for family members, whether it's an elderly person or a child and those childcare services or other services are not yet available. It's things like transportation not being at uh, full levels and or accessible transportation. And in some jobs, tourism industry with hospitality and so on, there's also further concerns that have been heightened around safety and security, everything from harassment that they're receiving from customers through higher contact points with, um, with, with consumers. And of course, there's been changing business practices as a result of this, and, and that's also affected a number of people who don't have the skills or can't manage under the new work arrangements. So there's a lot of very practical reasons that are really all about COVID. But I must add that there have also been issues that were there, uh, that we were, we, the economy overall and labor market overall was facing before the pandemic. And some of those have been heightened. And one of them that I know most will speak to at some point here is the fact that we've had a diminished pool of workers for some time. It's been a tight labor market before, but it's now become even more tight. And that includes uh, higher retirements and fewer students to draw from um, just the demographic of an aging population. There are mobility barriers. There has been more mental health issues and concerns raised. There are increased competitions from sectors as the pool of labor is, is tight. So everyone is, is going after it, but that's, uh, further exacerbated by certain kinds of incentivized efforts and programs that are that are really trying to retrain people from some sectors to others. And, and so there's a lot of different factors here. Combined, all these challenges and barriers are really impacting employers in many, many different industries. And these issues, to some extent, are a little more unique to tourism, hospitality, or the services sector, but that's a very large scale of the labor market. And I must add that because of the nature of that work, its protracted recovery means that these delays uh, are means that it's harder to hold on to some of those workers. Um, so finally, just one other comment here that for those that have been able to return to work, the increased demands in some sectors, especially healthcare and IT have enabled them to, to grow. And in fact, they've been able to, to um, take workers from the sectors that have not been able to recover at the same pace. So that's creating even bigger struggles and challenges in, in certain segments and indeed in the hospitality, tourism, or services area. I could go on, but I know that's a fairly lengthy response already to give a bit of a perspective. Thanks. Thank you for that. Yeah, you touched on a lot of factors, but I think that's 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 the way it is. Um, I saw a lot of head nods in the group. Um, are there any comments, Jeremy or Maha? Did, are you, any comments about um, what you've seen in, in, in the challenges of, of keeping staff at this time? I would just add that uh, I think Philip laid it out really well. Um, I think we also can't not factor that uh, government subsidies did play a role as well. Um, it is very difficult as a retailer um, to compete with CERB or, or similar in other provinces. So that's uh, another thing to consider. And I, I think Philip said it really well that the issues that we thought we had time to iron out really got exasperated and uh, really stressed um, our resources. 
sector. Uh, so on the technical front, on flexibility, um, centralizing, et cetera. Right. Thank you, Maha. Jeremy? Yeah, and I would just add, um, you know, Philip laid it all out very, very nicely. And to build on what Maha said as well, you know, the bottom line is just the ratio of, of posted openings to available applicant pool. Um, you know, the, the pool is very small. And so that puts, you know, most of the businesses in, in a competition state. Um, and it really is a matter of what is each business doing, um, you know, to demonstrate that they should be, you know, the choice for the candidates. Um, and um, as Maha said, you know, exhausting all of the tools that maybe it worked before and really needing to get creative and thinking about how do you how do you present your environment and your opportunities in a way that's most appealing, you know, to the candidates who have a, a lot of choice right now. That's great, Jeremy. It's a perfect segue into our next our next question. The theme of this of this workplace uh, panel was recruitment and retention in a post COVID era. Uh, admittedly, maybe a little optimistic, but uh, Julia, do you think recruitment and retention will look different or does it already look different? And what kind of practices do you think might come to the forefront here now that now that's what we're facing? Absolutely. Uh, I had an interesting experience with the pandemic as I was on parental leave kind of when it began and then returned to the workforce to a completely new um, world of recruitment. So I was kind of thrown right into what we're doing now, which is essentially all remote interviews. Um, I noticed certainly at the beginning, candidates were uncomfortable with interviewing on the computer. Many would make comments at the beginning about how this feels strange. They didn't like uh, the pauses and the lags, but over time I've seen a complete 180 and people are very comfortable. And there's so many benefits to being able to interview remotely. People don't need to leave their homes. They don't need to travel to the interview site. They can interview from across the world for companies. Um, and I also find that um, the nerves and the anxiety, now that people are on the computer and kind of face-to-face -face on Zoom every day, the nerves have come down. And I actually find people are more comfortable. Interviewing can be such a high pressure situation. And I'm really finding candidates to be more comfortable and more open um, with kind of this new this new style. So I certainly see that staying, um, you know, and even if it's just an option, you know, you can choose whether you'd like to come in in the future or choose online. I see that being something that stays permanently. That's great, that's great insight, Julia. Um, I'm curious, Maha and Ikea, are you finding that you're using online interview techniques more frequently? Yeah, it's a Yes and no, um, we've tried, um, but I, I think it does depend on the role. Um, when you're in retail and logistics, it is very difficult to get candidates uh, engaged on the virtual side. So we've really had a challenge because our recruiters are working virtually and are available. We have platforms, but we get a very high drop off rate uh, when we send invites on the virtual side. Um, it's also been very challenging because we might be the first round of free screening virtually, but we do need to meet the candidates in person because a lot of the jobs are frontline. So we can have candidates um, participate in a virtual interview for the first pre screening, but then we see sometimes the drop off rate because they don't want to come in in person or uh, closer to when the pandemic started, people were afraid of the job being in a store um, or in a warehouse. So um, it's been difficult to find that consistent rhythm. It works in certain markets, it doesn't work in others. The Quebec market in general is in incredibly tough. It's always been competitive. Uh, COVID and everything has just made Quebec very difficult to recruit in. Um, and the platforms don't really seem to make a difference. We've partnered with Indeeds and other major job boards who also tried virtual um, job fairs, et cetera, and it really hasn't been it hasn't been tremendously successful. So a variety of experiences there, I guess, depends on the, yeah, the level of employment, the nature of employment, the type of industry, uh, how effective that can be. I, I want to move on a little bit uh, and get to Aaron. Aaron, your role as an inclusion coach with Keys involves supporting employers to create more inclusive and equitable workplaces. What changes have you seen employers making over the last 18 months? And has COVID motivated them to adopt new inclusion practices? 
Thank you, Brady, and thank you all for sharing. Um, I started with Keys in May of this year, so I only have several months um, to base this question specifically on. But in some of my other roles, um, I have experienced quite an increase uh, in interest in accessibility and inclusion and EDI over the last 18 months. And specifically with my role with Keys Job Center, uh, I've worked with businesses to create new policies that prioritize disabled people rather than excluding them and making changes to outdated language that are that is included in policies to really approach um, disability through a more welcoming framework. And in addition, some businesses have requested consistent contact with inclusion coaches, as well as requests for significant action plans. In all of my roles, I'm finding that more and more people are wanting to listen, wanting to learn, wanting to unlearn. Social justice and disability justice have come into the mainstream during the pandemic. People are wanting to create access and to shift power imbalances and employers are understanding how these changes can result in employee recruitment and retention and benefit us all. Thanks. Thank you, Erin. I, I like how you hit that point on unlearn things. Uh, do you have some examples of, of things that employers need to, can work on unlearning? Yeah, I mean, I think, some of the biggest ones uh, I did mention in my video, but it's really um, consulting with, with the community. I think often people are very well intentioned and, and think that it will uh, help the most if, if they kind of create solutions. But really, in actuality, we can never know other people's lived experiences, and we really need to work collaboratively um, and unlearn some of those those ideas that, um, that yeah, we need, we need to know it all. And we don't need to know it all because everybody has that information for themselves. Um, in addition, I think just unlearning some of the, the attitudes um, and stereotypes that, that are systemic um, and, you know, that are not, you know, our fault that, that things are the way that they are, but it is up to us to start to question those things and, and to relearn some of um, maybe the values or, or beliefs that, that we have that, you know, disability um, and disabled people, you know, offer so much um, and can be a great strength to our workplaces and can be absolutely committed if the conditions are, are set up for them in advance. That's good. Yeah, that touches on hidden talent pools, which is something we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, I'm just curious, Jeremy, with Starbucks, are there some strategies that, that you guys have implemented since, since the pandemic that, that you found effective? Or have there been ones that you've had to, you know, uh, change or, or abandon? Yeah, I, I think if we want to call it a, a positive outcome is really the examination of, of, you know, the approach to the interviews and building a little bit on what Aaron was saying, um, really, you know, looking at the various communities and, and identities of candidates, you know, that apply for our businesses and helping to retrain our hiring manager managers away from some, you know, standard stereotypical things to watch for. For example, you know, did they make eye contact? contact or did they not make eye contact and understanding that from different cultural perspectives um, where making eye contact might mean something, you know, very different from one candidate to the other and really, you know, really trying to create that awareness um, to remove some barriers and roadblocks um, for candidates. So from an interviewing process, uh, we, we've seen that, you know, educationally become very positive. Um, like, physically what we've done to make changes is we've needed to build out, you know, a whole other branch of, of my team to focus on hourly hiring, you know, a model that we didn't have in place before because our store leaders are just needing that more direct hands-on support. Um, they're, they're busy running their business, they're short staffed, they, they don't have as much time to, to go out and, and, and put in creative um, recruitment solutions. So, you know, we've built a national team to get in and do that. Um, and, and, and it may stick, it may not, um, but just learning to evolve with the times for sure. Great, yeah, thank you, Jeremy. 
Um, I'm take this moment to address a couple of questions we have in our Q&A. Uh, first one from Wassam. For many years, I think that working remotely was asked from employers as a way to accommodate some people with disabilities and was not always something that employers were willing or able to offer. Now the pandemic has proven that everyone is able to work as good as or even better from their homes. How would that change your recruitment practices? Uh, of course, if as the position might allow. Um, so uh, let's start with Jeremy. Uh, how much? Yeah, um, I'm just trying to reiterate that question here. How, how would that change your recruitment practices? For sure, and, and it already has, um, you know, certainly from, you know, the, the partner employee base in our store locations, you know, as the question states, you know, based on the position, you know, they, they need to physically be there to do the job, but we have many, many other roles where pre-pandemic, they would have needed to be based in one of the three corporate offices that we have in Canada. And it really, um, you know, in hindsight, re restricted the talent that could be considered. And over the past year and a half, you know, we've been able to look at talent across the entire country. And we have, you know, we have internal promotions that have taken place or um, partners that have joined the company who live in, in locations that we never would have been able to look at before. And it's really bringing geographical diversity. Um, opening up you know our talent pools to look at um, experience from other markets and just uh, diversity and thought as, as well um, and so it's you know again a, a positive outcome of everything but definitely a shift that we're leaning into and i would say that extends across the border as well it's it's opened up uh, opportunity to even think about um, you know partners in canada or employees in canada you know looking at positions in the us in a different way than we could have before Thank you. Uh, Philip, do you have anything to add on, on the subject of how, how this is changing recruitment practices? You know, I, I'll pick up on, the, on that point and raise, raise another one. Um, you know, this remote working is something that will grow, we believe, quite a lot. And, and with it, of course, further supports and infrastructure so that these teams can work effectively. And we've seen those kinds of investments the, the thing that's uh, very clear about this opportunity is that you can really tailor it to the workers' needs. And in a tight labor market, it's really helpful because employers can start sharing workers. And that's a real trend that's moving forward is the need to, to um, you know, the scarce workforce means that those individuals have an opportunity to work with more than one employer in, in a number of their areas of capacity. And we're not limited by borders as, as we were saying. So that is definitely one of those those realities in terms of, of that trend issue. And if I can add one more, because I think it's related and it's really around the whole point of the digitalization and the impacts on the workforce. Actually, we had to do a large paper on this for OECD, but um, I'm gonna jump to the chase on it. What, what we know is that's also impacting the different types of skills that are needed of workers. And it's also increasing the, the type of work or different types of workers that are needed by businesses in order for them to to manage what they require. And it's changing some of the way the businesses are operating. And that's not a bad thing. Um, but the digitalization means that there, there's a larger pool of workers that we can tap into, particularly those that have been underrepresented in the labor market, who of course can benefit from this opportunity. So, you know, it's great. Digitalization is making a great difference and it's enabling groups to, to really be uh, connected to the workforce where it hasn't been in the past. And, and that's a good, a good message in, in general terms. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Maha, I see you've got your hand up. You've got something to add. Yeah, I just wanted to say, like, uh, I wanted to add on to what Jeremy was saying. It's had such a pot, this pandemic has had a positive impact on how we look at external recruiting. But for us, it's also really impacted how we look at internal recruiting. Um, and to the question, one thing we're able to do now that we, that just wasn't an option or just really wasn't for some reason in the, in the, um, uh, in our solutions is, is being able to give coworkers more hours virtually. So we have a call center in Quebec. Uh, if we need coworkers there, but it's very difficult to recruit in Quebec because of the tight uh, labor market, we're able to look at our internal workforce and say, who wants to take these hours? You can work anywhere in Canada and we can virtually have you participate. So uh, the internal experience has changed as well. The expectation that coworkers have that their organizations are going to give back take care of them, et cetera, um, has increased too. And the virtual working has allowed us to also meet that expectation. 
It's really interesting. Uh, <laughs> you, you touched on the next question from our audience was, Sarah is curious about the comment that it's been harder to recruit in Quebec. Can you briefly touch on the particular reasons why you mentioned Quebec? Sure. Um, sure. Um, we are having a very difficult time finding full-time workers. Um, the reason that we are seeing is government subsidies. We are competing. We realize that this is a challenge for us to look at our benchmarking because when we look at how our compensation has been previously benchmarked, we never considered government. Um, so we never considered we were competing with the government. So when we are competitive with other retailers. We're not competitive when it comes to competing with the government. So when we are offering part-time work, people want that, but we do have a need for full-time workers and in areas like Boucherville and Montreal, that has been really challenging. We also have um, a warehouse located in Broussard, uh, which has always been a little bit difficult to recruit for because of transportation. Um, and so because of the costs, it seems that that is also now um, an issue. So it's really forced us to relook at our compensation bands to see how we can match or what else, how creative can we get. Um, but I mentioned Quebec specifically because it's always been a tight uh, labor market. Um, there are higher expectations, I think, that candidates have and rightfully so. Um, and for us, to be honest with you, I think we thought we had more time to respond to it. Uh, we had things in place, but because of the pandemic, everything has, to, have, has had to accelerate. Okay. Okay. Uh, I just want to give Julia an opportunity, or Aaron, do you have anything to add on the topic before we go to the next question? I was just going to add on to what Maha was saying. Uh, it's been an interesting um, kind of thing for us as well, because we traditionally, you know, being a municipality have been, you know, located in Kingston and dealing with our own kind of small labor market here. Uh, but now people who are living in Kingston can easily get remote jobs working in Toronto with Toronto salaries. So it's been an, a very interesting time for us competing with salaries from much larger municipalities because people can work anywhere in Canada and then benefit from getting those higher salaries. Yeah, it, it's a real trend. Um, I got to say here in small town, Southern Alberta, we're just an hour south of Calgary. We've even seen, we've experienced this through housing sales. Um, more people are starting to reside in small communities because they can work remotely. And um, so lots of different impacts from that. Uh, moving on, I wanna jump back to Aaron. Um, you're an inclusion coach, but as you addressed in your recorded presentation, you have personal experience with exclusion and inclusion in the workplace. Um, you describe practices for building welcoming workplace uh, for the disability community. Can you speak to how some of these practices made a personal difference for you um, in, in, in your employer and how you look at the employer and how you look at your job? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, uh, employers who show uh, that they care about and that they acknowledge me and that they, you know, make small actions such as, you know, for this panel to send out questions in advance, that is one of my access needs. It really, um, you know, shows me that uh, these, these small little steps make a huge difference. Um, it creates positive impacts on the disability community. Um, and you know, it can take time to build up trust and relationships, um, and especially with people who have been historically excluded, but the sense of welcoming in these small steps uh, over time with commitment can really create positive change. Um, I think that it shows uh, that companies have been doing this work in advance and, what that says to me um, in my personal experience is that, you know, if I am exhausted for having to advocate constantly for myself for accessibility, um, these people are already doing the work. And so I don't have to constantly advocate for myself. And that really uh, has led to creating welcoming environments. I think it builds loyalty, it builds respect, um, and it really helps, it sets everybody up to do their best work. Um, yeah, thanks. 
Great. Yeah, no, I think we're touching on some great things here. Like in a more competitive, more challenging market, those small differences can be what makes a difference for the employer. Uh, it can make a difference for the employee. Um, and, you know, even again, referencing our small community, we, we've taken on this opportunity to use rural immigration to fill jobs in our small town to try to stay competitive. And I've recognized that what this pilot project that we're involved in probably isn't going to be a one off. Like this will be something that, you know, a, a labor tool, a labor pathway for the community, hopefully for, for the long term, because it's going to be it's going to be needed to stay competitive. Uh, Philip, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the concept of hidden talent pools. How conscious do you think employers are of the existence of hidden talent pools? And maybe you could provide some examples. Thank you for that, Brady. This is actually an area that this organization has been looking at for well over 20 years and measuring and reporting on. Um, it's a bit of a complex one to respond to, but I'll, I'll bring it down to some key ideas. I mean, increasingly over the past decade, we've seen this industry pick up a much more diverse workforce and it's largely reflective of shifting demographics, but there's other things at play, right? The global mobility patterns are changing. The type of consumer that we serve is changing. There's a much greater awareness around inequity afforded to people that are underrepresented in vulnerable groups in Canada, you know, particularly it's indigenous populations and people with disabilities. So this industry actually is uh, overall has always had a higher percentage of, of workers in this category compared to the economy overall, but it has led to a lot of uh, needs on the part of the employer to, to uh, change the way they manage their labor markets and, and to work more effectively with it. And that's not a bad thing. So many of the shifts are a response to the tight labor market issue and the growing demand for actually new skills. And what we're seeing, of course, is that there's been a shift of strategies, including policies, which are a major point of focus. And there's been much more investment in training and accommodation and so on. Um, I think there's a lot of good practices out there. But what I noticed as well is that the pandemic has really accelerated these efforts. And with it, a larger pool of employers are now tapping into these opportunities where they were not before, but they're asking for a lot of guidance. They're looking for supports. Um, it's not something that all of them are familiar with doing, at least at the scale that they need to. And this now has to be our shift in focus is really about how to help them do this. I guess I'm on mute. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Anybody have any other comments on, on hidden talent pools? I think it's a good subject. I'm curious, uh, maybe I'll go specifically. Julia, you know, have, has, has the city of Kingston started over the last years or recently, you know, started specifically looking at these hidden talent pools? We have, and it's been, you know, we've been fortunate that our timeline working with Keys, Keys Job Center and the Workplace Inclusion Charter has kind of aligned with the pandemic and you know not on purpose it's just been kind of the way that the world has been going um so keys has shared with us some great networks like the discoverability network um, and they've also hosted some great networking events with newcomers to kingston so we've been able to get involved in those types of events over the past year which has been great and having those events be remote i think has brought out a lot more people uh, in some cases i mean certainly that's not always the case but um, for example, I take care of our engineering department, and I found there was a really large turnout to the event for newcomers who are engineers in Kingston, um, so they were comfortable being on, on Zoom. Um, so we've been trying to kind of work with, the, with our partners at Keys, and, you know, we have a long way to go and a lot more hidden talent pools that we hope to, uh, you know, create partnerships with and reach out to, but it's certainly been something we've been working on this year. Good. So I see we have... Sorry, my Q&A keeps blocking my mute button, so I can't tell. If, <laughs> but uh, I see we have two questions, one in the Q&A and one in the chat. I'm just going to quickly go over this one in the chat. Uh, Jody would like to know what degree employers are investing in recruitment of Indigenous people given opportunities for remote work? Are they investing in digital infrastructure on reserves to support this opportunity uh, and, and utilize an untapped labor market, uh, given that we've all been speaking about a labor shortage? Uh, Jeremy, do you have, do you, can you pick this one up? Sure. Yeah, thank you, Brady. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I would say um, 
we're not as far along as we, we want to be or where our goal is, but certainly the recognition and acknowledgement um, of the work that needs to be done in that space is there. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, understanding that, you know, there's relationship building, um, you know, to be done to, to truly look at what, um, you know, what avenues or paths would be most beneficial, um, you know, whether it's bringing in, in Indigenous uh, community members or members from other communities, um, where maybe the traditional paths um, aren't as available for them, or, you know, there's different barriers that we need to work through. So if we look at our, our stores, um, it's a little bit easier where we're able to get into, you know, specific communities and build those relationships, um, you know, some programs in place, uh, certainly with local colleges and universities or even specifically with different indigenous bands. Um, we also have to look at the, the after hire um, training and anything that would maybe need to be done differently, understanding you know, what opportunities have been provided already. Um, from a, a digital perspective, um, we're truthfully you know, still working through how do we get the messaging out there? How do we do the discoveries that we need to do? How do we build the relationships, as I mentioned before? Um, because we do want members of all communities to know that there's opportunity with us but it's really it, it's it's about the education and getting that out there so those communities you know understand that uh, i'll open it to the floor if anyone has any other comments on the subject yeah philip i can speak to a specific example i mean in the tourism industry there's an organization called the indigenous tourism association of canada whom we work with very closely and in fact just for information and interest the whole tourism uh, indigenous tourism is, is the fastest and largest growing demand in the tourism area. It's a huge growth area. A lot of it is rural. And so this challenge of building an Indigenous workforce to supply the demand has been on the table for well over a decade and major investments by the federal government. And they've been quite successful. Um, and indeed, there's a demand for a lot of those Indigenous workers to work in non-Indigenous operations. So we've got a few strategies and plans uh, that support these initiatives in, in different ways. Um, it's a fairly complex discussion point because there's, um, there's quite a, a large uh, range of, of, of uh, different kinds of things there. If anyone wants to know more about it, I welcome you know, an email that I'm happy to follow up on to show the kinds of strategies that are employed both in the communities themselves and beyond and how we're helping target different demands and skill needs tailored to each of the of the learners in hand, right from entrepreneurial things through other kinds of skill areas. It's a big topic, much more than time permits for today to get into. Yeah, but I really appreciate the question. It also, it identifies an opportunity, you know, where, where reserves, you know, maybe could partner with the federal government, the provincial government, or even large businesses to, to bring that access to, to reservations. It's, any other comments on that before we move to our Q&A question? I just wanted to add that um, similar to as Jeremy saying, uh, we are really lucky that a lot of our stores are located very close to reserves. So it is on our agenda. It's we're actually in the middle of planning how can we reach out, what can we do. Um, I just wanted to add some color to a bit of the challenge for our recruitment team. We're stuck between stopping the bleeding and also progressing on strategies that will progress us forward. So our stores cannot open our restaurants right now fully because we don't have enough coworkers. So we have limited resources in our recruitment team that are focusing on what can we do to get all of our retail centers operational. And at the same time, we're trying to push the agenda forward. So this is a little bit of where, unfortunately, some of the delay is coming from because we just can't stretch. We have too many immediate things to look at. So one thing that I've been exploring with our EDNI team is establish networks that um, can easily partner with us so that there isn't a lot of change management that needs to happen and we can just sort of plug and play with them. And it has been difficult to find uh, institutions or partnerships like that, but we're making a better effort to reach out. But I just wanted to add some color that it's not lack of desire or not wanting. It, the issue is at least for retail and frontline, we're struggling as it is to staff and, and keep up with the turn, um, that it that's what's created a little bit of the, the slow movement in, in all sorts of EDI channels. Yeah, it's a really good point. You're, you know, 
putting out the fires while you're planning the new forest at the same time. Uh, here in Claire's home, uh, our local Tim Hortons can't stay open 24 hours a day. Uh, 7-Eleven has a 50% turnover. The, the workers there are stressed out. And even food production services, we have a, a food production outfit in town here and they're having to turn down some contracts because they don't have enough staff to run the evening shift. And, and so the writing is on the wall. Um, okay, let's get to some of this Q&A. It's been sitting here for a bit. Uh, Jenny's asked, uh, I've been hearing a lot about the US, I've been hearing a lot of the US in, from the US about the great resignation. What has your experience been like with the great resignation in Canada? Have you been seeing this? Um, I'm wondering, just first off, Aaron, I know you work with a lot of clients looking to improve their recruitment and retention. Um, have they been talking about you know, losing staff? Have they been experiencing that? All right. Um, I, I haven't specifically heard about people losing staff in, in the um, organizations that I've been working with, though so I do imagine that it is happening. Um, but I, yeah, I don't really have anything to, to speak to about that. I'll open it to the floor. Uh, any experience with the great resignation in Canada? Have we have been seeing this? Yes, is the answer. Yes, all the way around for, uh, around the country, we have been seeing it. Um, I don't. I, why the why we're still trying to understand. Um, some of it is compensation based. Some of it is just the fear of a fourth wave. Although IKEA didn't lay off a single coworker. Um, from the start of the pandemic, I think people are just afraid of what the restrictions will look like if there is a fourth wave. Um, but this has been, this is part of that hamster wheel. We hire and then we lose more people than we hire. Um, and that seems to be happening um, a lot, uh, especially in the logistics space. Hello? This is a question we're asked a lot um, at the policy level as well, and we've been studying it. and. I'm not sure that I would use the term great resignation, but what we do know is that the disruption in the labor market means that as much as 40 to 50% of workers will change jobs in these two years. And we're probably all seeing that around us. And that's because there's a lot of factors that have basically impacted their lives, let alone their work context, and they're having to adjust. So it's, it's related to family units as well as it's related to to different job opportunities and new kinds of demands that are out there. So, I mean, people are really just having to uh, realign all of their personal interests along with their professional interests in a time when there's been huge disruption. So it's not surprising to see people move on or shift to different roles and different jobs. Historically, if you look at any major disruption that there's been in workforces, this is a common pattern. And incidentally, Part of that as well has been the fact that this has been an aging demographic for quite some time and and many of the older people did uh, finally jump off that cliff they retired. Um, and so you know that that's contributing to about 20% of this resignation question, but but there's other other sort of factors that play about just the, the sheer volume of, of change that's occurred and, and new demands and roles, etc. That makes a lot of sense. Erin, you had something to add, I think. Yeah, uh, I have seen a lot of artists um, who no longer um, are working. Um, and a lot of that, I think, is uh, restrictions with COVID. Uh, there is no interest in, in digital performance for many people. And there's a real need for, for income. So a lot of um, artists have shifted out of um, what they were doing and now, you know, are, are no longer making art. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Julia or Jeremy, Julia, did you have anything to add? Um, I think we're certainly, we are seeing certainly more turnover than, than would be normal. I think we're in a fortunate position in somewhat, uh, we have some factors that do retain people like having an OMERS pension plan, uh, it does kind of keep people a little bit longer, but certainly I'm seeing with newer hires, uh, you know, I hired someone in August who's resigned already. Um, and that in the past is not something I was seeing. So I think there is a little bit of 
uncertainty of like where people want to be, what they want to do. And, um, you know, a lot more um, people are a lot more comfortable leaving jobs right now, I would say. Yeah, and I would agree and, and build on what everyone is saying, certainly with frontline workers. And one um, aspect we've uh, experienced is that some companies, you know, with the increase in, in at-home deliveries, um, just the, the increased need for individuals in the tech space, you know, some of our frontline workers could move away from that public interaction and into a space where they can now now work digitally and feel safer. And so just a shift in, in industry completely. Um, the other thing I would add in, in Maha, I, I, I could tell that you were experiencing this is recruiters themselves are in high demand. So not only are our recruiters really busy trying to find the employees, but our recruiters are making decisions to go to other organizations because they're being heavily recruited um, with some companies that have you know, they're offering incredible sign-on bonuses and, and uh, super high salaries. And so it's, you know, one thing leads to the other. So it's not just, you know, a, a certain, like an individual situation that we're trying to tackle. It's really the cause and effect of all of it. Great, great. Hopefully that has answered Jenny's question. We have a few more questions rolling in, um, but I, I do want to get to a question, a couple of things here first. Uh, Maha, I IKEA has a refugee employment program. Could you briefly tell us about the refugee employment program? Sure. Um, yeah, it's uh, this is part of IKEA's quality plan. So this is IKEA Canada's commitment as well as our global commitment. Um, locally, our commitment is to support 250 refugees um, over 30 countries by 2022. Um, and so we have, and what we offer is a like a job ready program. So we offer virtual customer service training um, uh, programs. We offer language support, some work placements as well um, can lead to a permanent job if that's what the um, candidate wants. And uh, we have lots of mentorship pairings. So this is really just to help bridge and get um, refugees or people that identify um, ready uh, and willing. And if we're not the place for them in the future, then we're helping them to get ready for that next place. Yeah, a great strategy to access one of those hidden talent pools. Um, I've been watching uh, the federal government is, I think, soon coming out with the Economic Mobilities Pathway Program for skilled refugees. And, and even here in Clarsoma, I just see it as another opportunity to bring a labor pathway to our local businesses. And what a, what a great way to do it. Um, Jeremy, your video uh, touched on Starbucks partner networks, which are staff groups that bring together people with shared identities and experiences. Can you tell us a little bit more about how those partner networks work and, and share some examples? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Brady. Um, yeah, and I, I know a lot of organizations might refer to them as employee resource groups, but, you know, essentially they're um, they're networks that are formed by partners for other partners, and uh, they're really um, built cross-functionally. And so um, leaders within our stores or partners within our stores, you know, working with partners, you know, and other cross-functional groups. And, and really the idea is to bring awareness and attention and, and celebration um, and support, you know, for different um, uh, initiatives or um or uh, you know issues you know that may arise for different demographics um and i would say uh you know we've increased the number of those networks over the past year and a half you know really the um the desire to you know continue to bring partners together uh and have a place to share um really encouraging advocates and um allies to get involved as well um and one of the major benefits that we've seen you know coming out of that is the introduction of what we refer to as courageous conversations and those are, are essentially you know panel discussions just like this where we're bringing um, internal partners and members of the external community together to speak on different topics and issues to provide that education and then we see that filter down to smaller teams where the leaders are are building on that conversation and um, you know helping to Im just improve inclusion and diversity overall. Great, thank you for sharing that initiative. I thought that was an uh, interesting approach. Um, I wanna go to, to uh, Julia. As recruitment and selection advisor with the city of Kingston, do you work at all with the economic development department to connect charter recommendations or other EDI practices uh, to, the, to your, 
your business community? Yeah, we've, we've had an interesting kind of um, set up for how we kind of all communicate together because we do, we have a strategic partnerships group uh, and they were actually involved in kind of the creation of the workplace inclusion charter in Kingston. Uh, and then they connected us with Keys Job Center, who provided us with a project supervisor from Keys and an inclusion coach. So they helped us um, with some of our EDI initiatives kind of earlier in the year. And then we've also created an EDI office, which reports directly into our CAO's office. Um, and that's it. That's new for us and really exciting. So we kind of all work together um, and it's been nice to kind of share ideas and hopefully moving forward, even though we are all in different departments, it's nice to kind of have this group dynamic going and we all have different ideas, but hoping to move things forward more quickly because we're all in different areas of the organization. That's great. Yeah, I was hoping that that the answer was something like that, but yes, uh, that sounds excellent. Um, I got in my own personal notes here from Aaron's presentation. You, you talked about ableism. And I just wondered if you could briefly touch on ableism. I know we're, we're getting down to the last nine minutes, but we're gonna try to get as much done as we can. Yeah, ableism is a huge topic, uh, but I guess just briefly, it is um, discrimination against disabled people. Um, I would also include in that um, sanism, which would be um, discrimination against, you know, minds that are maybe different than what we might expect as well as ageism and and many many other isms which you know i believe are all a product of uh systemic issues um ableism can be you know stereotypes it's often um well-intentioned but basically it is creating a hierarchy and saying that you know disabled people or whatever communities are are less than um, you know, so it's often this ingrained um, mindset of, uh, you know, disabled people are to be pitied or, or feared, and maybe it's not, you know, an outward thing, but it, it's under there. It's been ingrained in most people for, for a very long time. So I would encourage people to really start to evaluate that. It's, you know, language, um, language does matter. And, and every person has their own, you know, personal preferences. So asking people what, what they prefer um, rather than assuming can be really helpful. Um, and I often get comments about from, from employers, from all kinds of people um, saying that they don't want to, you know, learn about access and un start to undo ableism. Uh, because they don't have, you know, um, employees or customers or whatever who need these things. And until that point, they won't learn that. But once they have people come in, then they will. And to me, that's backwards, because until you create the environment where people uh, feel welcome and have what they need in order to succeed, then they won't come. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um... What was I going to say? Sorry, I draw a blank there. Um, I think that is a great answer. Uh, and I wanted to go for our next q and I, I guess I'm feeling the pressure. It's showing here. But I'm going to put this. Uh, well, this first question from Miriam. Why are businesses so afraid to hire talents with foreign credentials and foreign experiences? Uh, I want to, I think I can touch a little bit on that. And a lot of it is the credentials that are required for different governing bodies in different organizations, right? Whether it be healthcare or science or engineering, um, even construction. Uh, I think these, one of the challenges is that these individual uh, credential or authoritative bodies don't recognize those credentials. And so it's a difficult challenge to, to tackle. Um, but I wonder if Philip, if you have anything to add on that subject, why we don't access those foreign credentials more frequently. Well, I mean, I think that you hit one of it on the nail. We did a very large project with the federal government on foreign credential recognition, both in the regulated and non-regulated side. In fact, I also worked on a panel that helps set the standards for those that review those credentials in these regulatory bodies and, and how it is they make decisions on it. So, I mean, on one hand, there's got to be some policy shifts there. But the other reality, one of the major stark realities we came across was that employers really had a difficult time understanding or sorting through or looking at credentials that were not local. In fact, um, you know, they, they just couldn't trust them as the words that came up in focus group meetings. And it was not that they weren't interested, but they just didn't know how 
they translate it into Canadian practice, as it were. And so they default frequently to what they know and who they know rather than what the credential says. And some of that is founded because a number of these um, papers that people present are not trustworthy. So there's complexity there in trying to sort through that stuff. However, what we keep telling people and what we strongly recommend is, is really you can mitigate a number of those issues if you just practice good uh, selection and hiring processes with the right kinds of interviews and that can mitigate a lot of it. So I think there's a bit of an educational exercise at hand here. Kind of touches on one of our other questions here. You know, EDI is typically seen as part of an, an organization's corporate social responsibility portfolio, but I think we're getting to a point now where employers are realizing EDO could be, EDI could be a, a core practice. You know, and I, and I think it kind, kind of what to Aaron's saying, you know, like that chicken and egg thing, until it's a core practice, you won't see those benefits. You know, it's better to be proactive and, and implement early. Um, Final question uh, to everybody here. How can service provider organizations work more effectively with employers to improve inclusion in the workplace? Just some high, you know, high level tips here. What, what's it gonna take to have to make that connection? And, and let's start with Julia. Yeah, you know, I think sharing with each other. Uh, we've talked a lot about kind of the lack of uh, candidates today. So there is really a highly competitive nature to the market right now. But even, you know, what Erin said today about how much she appreciated receiving the interview questions in advance, got me thinking about sharing, you know, interview questions for recruitment in advance and without kind of coming together and having these conversations, those types of ideas don't get shared. So uh, creating a kind of a a way to share with each other, I think, because we're all working towards the same goals is important for the future and for success for everybody. Excellent, thank you. Jeremy? Yeah, I, I would say similar. It's, um, you know, I, I think in, in building off of what Philip was saying as well and the question around credentials, you know, how do we move away from that underlying fear of what's different from what we know or what our own experiences is to, to understand, you know, others, perspectives, other practices, and how that can benefit. Um, so I think the more education companies can receive, you know, from those support affiliations um, around, you know, how, how the uh, individuals they're working with can be qualified and the strengths and skills that they can bring, um, you know, the better we're going to be in the future because we, we start learning, you know, more about the value and understanding, you know, those experiences that are different than ours. Thank you, Jeremy. I want to put it over to Maha. How can employers work more effect, or how can service org providers work more effectively with employers uh, to improve inclusion in the workplace? Um, again, I, I agree with what has been said. It's just the education because we, again, at least for IKEA, we are really focused on the immediate right now. Um, it would be fantastic if service providers could reach out to me to let me know what they would like to see. Um, some suggestions, solutions, how, how other companies are doing it. Like we're very open to hearing it. Um, and I, I think that's how, it's, it's just knowing that we, at least at IKEA Canada, we are really open to learning and to working with any service provider that can provide any advice how we could get better. Because um, as you said, this is a core practice. It has been for a really long time um, for IKEA Canada. Uh, we are a value-based organization and it's very important that that we do that. So I'm, we're very open. So I think it's just keeping the dialogue open. And I, I guess it's also networking. I think service providers need to know who to reach out to as well. Um, so I'm happy to be that person. <laughs> and that uh, we didn't get to the question, but uh, IKEA and uh, Starbucks both both partner with Access Employment in Ontario to, to reach out to some of those networks, right? Um, Aaron, anything to add on that initial question? How, how can we work more effectively with our employers? I, I would just echo what everybody else has said. I think it yeah. was, yeah, said really, really well. Education, time, yeah. prioritizing. Fi final thoughts from Philip. You know, I, I agree in, entirely with this. One of the reflections I had is that um, I think there's a lot of good tools and information there for sure, but I wonder if employers know how to tap into it. and. It struck me that many employers are already connected through other professional channels or associations. I'm wondering if there's an opportunity for 
these serving agencies or these agencies to work with those associations to help it as a key vehicle or channel to get some of this information out. Um, I, I know that they, you know, employers are inundated with lots of information and demands and requests, and it's hard for them to keep up with all of it, but they have an affinity to those associations and it just might be a smart tactic and, and a, an avenue to help get that information out and to build some awareness and then and, and with that in mind, then give them a chance for more education and supports. Excellent. Well, fortunately, we didn't get to all the questions today, uh, but we did have some fantastic discussion. I want to thank you so thank you so much to our panelists for your time and your participation. Uh, thank you to the audience for your engagement and your questions. And of course, Laura Branner uh, of the Lethbridge Lit for inviting me to moderate today. The National Workplace Forum has more than a dozen pre-recorded sessions for you to enjoy, and you can choose your own adventure this afternoon by registering for those sessions that interest you. Uh, these will also be available online and available on the YouTube page. Uh, I don't know about everyone else, but I'm heading to institutional bias, common bias that affects newcomers during the hiring process. Starts at 11, and I'm pretty sure you can still register. My name is Brady Schnell uh, from the town of Claire's home in Southern Alberta. Thank you again and have a great day, everybody. <laughs>